which is to protect women and children and, and communities from toxic chemicals. As many of you know from participating in prior sessions that in this series we've been focusing on unconventional natural gas development and extraction, otherwise known as fracking, and exploring the potential health impacts for women of childbearing age, pregnant women, and infants and children. We will continue with that today with another session by a researcher who has been working in the field of public health and environmental health. Today we have with us Dr. Lisa McKenzie. Dr. McKenzie is a research associate at the Colorado School of Public Health on the University of Colorado Denver's Anschutz Medical Campus. She holds a bachelor's in chemistry from the University of Colorado, a master's in public health and epidemiology from the Colorado School of Public Health, and a PhD in environmental chemistry from the University of Montana. Dr. McKenzie's research focuses on human exposures to chemicals in air and resulting health outcomes, as well as the health effects associated with climate change. She teaches graduate level and undergraduate level courses in risk assessment and environmental health. She began her career as an environmental analytical chemist with the Environmental Protection Agency and has worked for many years in the private sector as a human health risk assessor and chemist. Dr. McKenzie's research has contributed to the understanding of how air pollutants and other exposures affect the health of people living in natural gas development areas. Dr. McKenzie was a co-investigator on a health impact assessment study which assessed potential health impacts associated with a proposed natural gas development project, as well as a principal author of the Supporting Human Health Risk Assessment published in the Science of the Total Environment. That was in March 2012. Her most recent study on birth outcomes in areas with natural gas development was published in Environmental Health Perspectives in April 2014. Dr. McKenzie has testified before the United States Congress and the Denver Metropolitan Regional Air Quality Council on the public health implications of natural gas development. So welcome, Dr. McKenzie. Thanks for being with us here today. We're ready to get started. Um, I will turn the presentation over to you now. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I believe we can hear you just fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, will be I will be presenting the results of our recent study on adverse birth outcomes to mothers living in proximity to natural gas development. First, I'm going to provide a little background on the topic. Then I'll explain our study methods and present our results. Uh, I'll finish by discussing the limitations of our study and some take-home points. In the United States, for every 1,000 babies born, 33 will have a major birth defect. These birth defects are a major contributor to infant mortality and overall morbidity. Annual health care costs can exceed $2 billion. Congenital heart defects, oral clefts, and neural tube defects are among the most common classes of birth defects. What is causing all these birth defects is not well understood. They are thought to originate in the first trimester of pregnancy as a result of an inherited genetic traits or interactions between genes and environmental stressors. Many environmental stressors have been implicated, such as folate deficiency, maternal smoking during pregnancy, and maternal exposure to solvents during pregnancy. Other birth adverse birth outcomes with significant health consequences include preterm birth and low birth weight births. These outcomes are more prevalent than the birth defects and they affect 12, up to 12 out of 100 babies born in the United States. Maternal exposures to hazardous air pollutants may affect the developing fetus. Several studies have associated maternal exposure to toluene, xylene, and benzene with increases in the prevalence of birth defects. Other studies have associated maternal exposure to particulate matter, 
nitrogen dioxide in volatile organic compounds to low birth weight and preterm births. Natural gas development is an industrial process resulting in community exposures to multiple environmental stressors. Diesel-powered heavy equipment is used for worksite development as well as transporting large volumes of water, sand, and chemicals to sites and for waste removal. Studies in Colorado, Texas, Wyoming, and Oklahoma have demonstrated that natural gas development results in the emission of all to organic compounds nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are emitted either from the well itself or from associated drilling processes or related infrastructure. These would include uh, drilling muds, hydraulic fracturing fluids, tanks containing wastewater and liquid hydrocarbons, diesel engines, compressor stations, dehydrators, and pipelines. Some of the pollutants already mentioned, toluene, xylene, and benzene, are suspected teratogens or mutagens and are known to cross the placenta. This raises the possibility of fetal exposure to these and other pollutants from natural gas development. The development and production of natural gas has occurred very near homes, um, as shown in the picture here. Until recently in Colorado, regulations allowed wells to be located as close as 150 feet from a home. And to put that into perspective, um, 150 feet is about one half of a football field. With new regulations uh, in Colorado, the wells now must be at least 100 feet, or excuse me, 500 feet from a home. Uh, the development of natural gas wells also involves large volumes of truck traffic. And this contributes uh, to the air pollution, noise, and stress level around the sites, as well as along the haul routes. Around-the-clock truck tra trips to support well development can exceed 1,000 trips per well. So this map shows the extent of oil and gas development in Colorado. The red on the map shows active wells, and the green indicates where there have been permits filed for wells. And uh, most of the activity is occurring in rural areas in Colorado. Uh, up here in northeast Colorado, quite a bit of activity in Well County. That's where the most activity is, followed by northwestern Colorado in Garfield County. Um, However, it's becoming increasingly common for natural gas development to encroach on more populated areas, potentially exposing more people to air and water emissions as well as noise and community level changes that might arise from industrialization. In our previous risk assessment, we estimated some of the health hazards that could be associated with living near natural gas development operations. That study identified uh, developmental effects as a potential hazard. This observation, along with the growing potential for maternal exposure to air pollutants from natural gas development and vulnerability of the developing fetus to environmental stressors, motivated us to conduct this study. Colorado's systematic tracking of birth of data on both birth outcomes and oil and gas development also was a motivating factor. Our goal was to explore the association between maternal exposure to natural gas development and birth outcomes using a data set with individual level birth data and geocoded natural gas well locations. Using a retrospective cohort study design, we determined past individual maternal exposures to natural gas development during pregnancy. We then followed each mother to determine the birth outcome in her infant. Our cohort included almost 125,000 infants that were born between 1996 and 2009 in rural Colorado. The mothers lived in rural Colorado. Uh, the mothers living in metropolitan areas with populations of greater than 50,000 people were excluded from the study. 
the cohort was restricted to white Hispanic and white non-Hispanic mothers because over 95% of our population fell into these two ethnic categories. The cohort also was restricted to singleton live births. So now I'm going to um, walk you through how we det determine the exposure. So we defined exposure as the existence of a gas well within 10 miles of the mother's uh, home within the year that the child was born. We used geocoded well locations available from the Colorado Oil and Gas Information System to identify these existing gas wells. The mother was considered unexposed if there were no gas wells existing in the year of birth uh, within this 10-mile area. By existing well, we mean that there was evidence that the well was present and not abandoned in the year the infant was born. We found when we looked at the distribution of wells within this 10-mile radius for all 125,000 births that 50% of the wells were within 2.3 miles of the mother's home and 90% of the wells were within 7.7 .7 miles of the mother's home. So in addition to the number of wells near the mother's home, it's also important to consider how far the wells were from her home. As shown in this figure, I'll start with the one in the upper left, um, the potential for exposure uh, to emissions from natural gas development would be much higher if all the wells were very near the home, let's say within a mile of the home here, compared to if all the wells were nine miles from the home, represented by this figure on the upper left, uh, upper right. And then we could have any um, distribution of wells between those two extremes. And where they are is going to make uh, would make a big difference in what type of emissions or how many emissions the mother might be exposed to. So to address this, we used an inverse distant weighted approach, and this is commonly used in individual air pollutant exposures in studies looking at individual air pollutant exposures from multiple fixed locations. And in the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through exactly how we calculated this inverse distance weighted well count. So this first slide is showing what we did is the first thing we did is we measured the distance of every well from the mother's home. So in this case we're looking at four wells. For each of the four wells we, dis we calculated the distance of that well from the mother's home. And then we calculated the inverse of the distance by dividing 1 by the distance of the well from the mother's home. In other words, we took the reciprocal. And we did this for each well. After we had calculated the inverse, inverse distance weight for each well, we then summed all those inverse distance weights of the wells within the 10-mile radius. And this, this allowed us to give more weight in the sum of our wells to those wells that were closest to the mother's home. So that the wells closest to the home had more influence in the exposure measurement than those that were, than those that were further away. And here are here's some examples of how the uh, calculations, uh, all based on four wells within that 10-mile distance. If each well was one mile from the mother's home, shown here in the first bullet, the inverse distance weight sum would be four. So the four would be our exposure measurement. If all the wells were five miles away, the sum shown here in the second point, bullet, the sum of those wells would be 0 0.8. So our exposure would be represented by 0 0.8. Then if two wells were a mile away and two wells were two miles away, shown down here in the third bullet, our exposure estimate, our inverse distance weighted well count would be 
So you can see using the sum of the inverse distance weights as the exposure gives a larger exposure measurement as more of the four wells are located closer to the home. So after we had calculated the sum of the inverse distance weighted counts for each, um, for each birth, we then divided our exposed group into tertiles, into three tertiles. We had a low tertile, which was 1.3.62 wells per mile. Our medium tertile was 3.63 to 125 wells per mile. And our highest tertile was 126 to 1400 wells per mile. Then after we had assigned the mothers to either the unexposed group or their exposure tertile, we then followed them for these birth outcomes. We looked at three classes of birth defects, congenital to heart defects, neural tube defects, and oral clefts, and two other adverse birth outcomes, preterm birth and term low birth weight. In the congenital to heart defects, we included conotruncal defects, endocardial and mitral valve defects, pulmonary artery and valve defects, tricuspid valve defects, aortic artery and valve defects, ventricular septal, defect, septal defects, and patent ductus arteriosus in bursts greater than 2,500 grams. The oral clefts included cleft lip with and without cleft palate as well as cleft palate. Neural tube defects included encephalus and spina bifida. Preterm birth was defined as less than 37 weeks of gestation and included premature births. Term low birth weight was defined as infants that had more than 37 weeks of gestation and that weighed less than 2,500 grams at their birth. We used logistic regression to compare the prevalence of each birth outcome in the unexposed group to the prevalence of each birth outcome in each of the three exposure groups. So that's the low, medium, and high uh, exposure groups. We adjusted the analyses where we could for multiple potential confounders and covariates, and these included maternal smoking and alcohol use, elevation of the mother's home, and infant junk gender, as well as many others. An odds ratio greater than one indicates a positive association between the exposure and birth outcome may exist, while an odds ratio of less than one indicates a negative association between the exposure and birth outcome. An odds ratio of one indicates no association. We also considered the trend in the odds ratios from low to high exposure group. So that uh, concludes my explanation of, of how we did this study. And now I'll go through the results. And as shown here, the births were approximately evenly divided between the exposed and unexposed groups. So the uh, exposed groups are the purple, green, and red here. And the unexposed is the blue. 47% of the births in rural Colorado between 1996 were to mothers who had at least one well within 10 miles of her home. The next few figures will show some of the uh, cohort characteristics. This figure shows the distribution between white non-Hispanic and white Hispanic mothers in our cohort with the percentages being here on the y-axis and the groups being on the x-axis. Uh, you can see that approximately 70% of the mothers were white, non-Hispanic, and that there was little difference between the unexposed group and the three exposure groups in the uh, distribution of ethnicity. This next graph uh, shows the percentage of smokers in each of our groups. Once again, percentage on the y-axis. Uh, overall, 
less than 14% of the mothers in our cohort were smoking during their pregnancy. And the lowest occurrence of uh, smoking during pregnancy was in the highest exposure tertile. We did adjust uh, most of our results for smoking. We also looked at elevation as shown here. Uh, the elevation above sea level is shown on the y-axis here in feet. Exposure groups across the x-axis. And you can see here that the mean elevation in our unexposed group was 1 to 2,000 times higher than the mean elevation in our three exposed groups. This is because there are almost no gas wells above 7,000 feet in Colorado. And in Colorado, many of our uh, rural Coloradans live above 7,000 feet. So if you're living above, above 7,000 feet in Colorado, that by definition means you're most likely not to be uh, exposed to oil and gas development in your home. Okay, the next slides are actually going to show the results of the logistic regressions. And on these slides, the odds ratios will be presented on the y-axis, exposure groups will be presented on the x-axis, and the bars uh, represent the 95% confidence intervals. Um, our, for the congenital heart defects, our adjusted estimates indicate a monotonic increasing trend in the prevalence of the congenital heart defects with increasing exposure to natural gas development as represented by inverse distance weighted well counts. Birth to mothers in the most exposed tertile here had a 30% greater prevalence of congenital heart defects than birth to mothers with no wells within the 10 mile radius of their residence. And these results were adjusted for maternal age, ethnicity, smoking, alcohol use, education, elevation of residents, as well as infant parity and gender. When we, we saw even stronger associations when we looked at more specific heart defects. Exploratory analysis of congenital heart defects by clinical diagnostic groups indicate increased prevalence of pulmonary artery and valve defects by 60% in the highest exposure group, uh, higher prevalence of ventricular, ventricular septal, defect, septal defects, 50% in the highest exposure group, and tricuspid valve defects with a 400% increase in the most exposed tertile when we compare them to uh, births with no wells within that 10 mile radius. The prevalence of neural tube defects was positively associated with only the third exposure tertile based on an odds ratio that was only adjusted for elevation. Births in the highest tertile were two times more likely to have a neural tube, neural tube defect than those with no wells within the 10 mile radius. And this was based on 15, 59 available cases. We observe no statistically significant associations between oral clefts and natural gas development um, based on our trend analysis across categorical inverse, inverse distance well counts. Adjusted estimates for preterm births suggested a slight decrease of preterm birth with increasing exposure to natural gas development. So possibly a protective effect. And we also observed, shown here on the upper graph, a weak nonlinear trend in the adjusted odds ratios for term low birth weight. The association is consistent with multiple linear regression results shown here on the lower graph in which mean birth weights were 5 to 25 grams greater in the higher um, exposure tertiles 
than in our unexposed group. The small negative associations with term low birth weight and preterm birth in our study population were unexpected given that other studies have reported positive associations between these outcomes in urban air pollution and proximity to natural gas wells. It is possible that rural air quality near natural gas wells in Colorado is not as compromised as urban air quality uh, that was represented in other studies and exposure represented by inverse distance weighted well count may not well represent air quality. In addition, the power of our large cohort increases the likelihood of false positive results for small associations close to the null or close to one, an odds ratio of one. While associations were consistent across measures of birth weight, they attenuated towards the null or towards one in our sensitivity analysis for two and five mile radio, which I'm going radii, which I'm going to explain next. If causal, stronger associations would be expected as with more stringent exposure definitions, and we did not observe this. Our incomplete ability to adjust for socioeconomic status, health, nutrition, prenatal care, and pregnancy complications likely accounted for these unexpected results. To evaluate whether a 10 mile radius around the mother's home adequately described the exposed group, we explored a two mile radius defining exposure as a two mile radius where now our exposed group was anyone with no wells within two miles and we also looked at a five mile radius where our unexposed group were the mothers with no wells within five miles. And the results were very similar to those as we had for the 10 mile radius, 10 mile radius with a few minor differences. We observed a monotonic increase in the prevalence of neural tube defects with increasing exposure in the sensitivity analysis. And we also observed some attenuation and decreased risk for, treat, for the preterm birth and low term birth weight. That is, those results move towards the null or towards an odds ratio of one. Next, I'm going to discuss the limitations of our study. And um, because of the limitations, I'm going to be discussing this. It's important to keep these in mind. Our, our findings are, are preliminary um, because of the nature of the data we were given. The number of birth defects are most likely undercounted because non-life births terminated pregnancy and uh, birth defects that were diagnosed later in life after three years of age were not included in our study. This led to an undercount and an undercount is most likely to weaken our, would most likely weaken our observed associations. Also, due to the rarity of the specific birth defects in the study population, we aggregated the birth defects into the three general groups, congenital heart defects, neural tube defects, and oral clefts. This limited our study in that associations with specific birth defects, if they were present, may have been obscured, and our observed associations may have been weakened. Indeed, our exploratory analyses of congenital heart defects by clinical diagnostic groups presented earlier indicated increased prevalence of specific diagnostic groups compared to the aggregated congenital heart defects. Data on covariates were obtained from the birth certificates and the vital statistics, and they were limited to the basic demographic education and behavioral information recorded on the birth certificates. Distribution of covariates among exposure turtles and unexposed group were similar. Nonetheless, their incomplete ability to adjust for socioeconomic status, health, nutrition, prenatal care, and pregnancy complications may have resulted in residual confounding. In addition, for low event outcomes like the neural tube defects, we only adjusted for elevation. The data set did not contain information on maternal folate consumption and genetic anomalies, both independent predictors of our outcomes. This may have confounded our results. 
we did not observe a large decrease in the prevalence of neural tube defects after the introduction of folic acid in 1998, and small increases in the prevalence of congenital heart defects and oral clefts, albeit none of the estimates were statistically significant. Further study is needed to determine if unaccounted folate confounding is weakening our results. We have no evidence to indicate genetic anomalies would differ by inverse distance weighted well counts around the maternal residence. Perhaps our greatest limitation was exposure misclassification. Because we did not have maternal residential history, we assumed that maternal address at the time of delivery was the same as the maternal address during the first trimester of pregnancy, the critical time period for formation of birth defects. Studies in Georgia and Texas estimate that 22 to 30 percent of mothers move during their pregnancy and most mothers move within their locality potentially introducing some exposure misclassification for the early pregnancy period of interest. However, these studies found little difference in mobility between cases and controls, and maternal mobility did not significantly differ or did not significantly influence the assessment of benzene exposure. That was the exposure the studies were looking at. We were only able to determine if a well existed within the calendar year of birth and did not have sufficient data to determine if a well existed within the first trimester of the pregnancy. Therefore, some non-differential exposure misclassification is likely, and the overall effect of this non-differential exposure misclassification is not known. We also only had consistent information on existence of a well in the birth year. Lack of information on natural gas well activities such as whether or not the wells were producing or undergoing development or hydraulic fracturing may have resulted in exposure misclassification. Actual exposure to natural gas related pollutants likely varies by the intensity of development activities. Lack of temporal and spatial specificity of the exposure assessment most likely tended to weaken our associations. To address spatial and temporal variability, additional air pollution measurements and modeling will, need to be, will be needed to improve exposure estimates at specific locations. And then lastly, we didn't have information on the mother's activities away from her residence, such as her occupation and what she did for recreation, as well as the proximity of these activities to natural gas development were not available, so the activities where they were happening, how close they were to natural gas development, and this may have led to further exposure misclassification and residual confounding. So uh, some next logical steps for additional studies for uh, low birth weight in preterm birth would be to do some pro prospective cohort studies where you gathered baseline information in a population and then followed that population through the course of development of some wells and uh, followed the um, pregnant women for these outcomes in their children. The birth defects, which are a rarer uh, birth outcome, would be much more difficult to do in a prospective uh, cohort design. A case control study would probably work better for that, um, in where you would confirm the mother's residence in her first trimester, uh, determine what the parents, including the father's occupation was, what type of folate consumption the mother, whether she has prenatal vitamins, that type of thing. Uh, investigate what specific activities were happening on the well pad during that first trimester of pregnancy, as well as any other significant environmental exposures uh, the mother may have had in her first trimester of pregnancy. So in conclusion, our study suggests a positive association between greater density and proximity of natural gas wells within a 10-mile radius of the maternal residence and a greater prevalence of congenital to heart defects and possibly neural tube defects, but not oral clefts, preterm birth, or reduced fetal growth.
Further studies incorporating information on specific activities and production levels near homes over the course of pr pregnancy would improve exposure estimates and provide more refined effect estimates. It is important to continue uh, studying the potential health effects that may be associated with oil and gas development. The Wall Street Journal estimates that over 15 million Americans live within one mile of an oil and gas well that was drilled since the year 2000. Our results, results of other research teams, and the current trends in natural gas development underscore the importance of conducting more comprehensive, rigorous research on the potential health effects of oil and gas development using unconventional methods. The co-investigators on this study were Ro Roxana Witter, John Adgate, Lee Newman, and Ray Gao at the Colorado School of Public Health, and David Savage at Brown University. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and the Colorado Response to Children with Special with special needs sections provided outcome data for this study. They do specifically disclaim responsibility for any analysis, interpretations, and or conclusions. The Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the Colorado School of Public Health funded this study. Thank you for your attention. And I think Ellen will uh, take questions now. Yes, thank you, Dr. McKenzie. Thank you for educating us about your research study. Um, let's now open up the session for questions. Um, if attendees have questions, please go ahead and type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. Um, so Dr. McKenzie, we have our first question here. Um, okay. And the first question is, um, can you put the congenital heart defects results into context? Okay, so our study saw a 30% a increase in congenital heart defects in the most exposed Tertile. And to put that a little bit into perspective, in the United States, about eight in a thousand births have a congenital heart defect. In Colorado, about 18 in a thousand births have a congenital heart defect. So th these study results, um, a 30% increase would be approximately six, six additional congenital heart defects per a thousand births in Colorado. Okay, we have our next question here, which is, okay. why did you exclude metropolitan areas? Uh, the reason why we excluded the metropolitan areas was to uh, try to narrow down other sources of air pollution. Uh, the rural areas have less industrial activity, uh, less traffic, and less other sources of environmental contamination. Great. And our next question is, can you comment on the recent spikes in stillborn and neonatal deaths in drilling dense regions of Colorado? Uh, one was Glenwood Springs and the other was Vernal, Utah. I, I cannot uh, comment on those studies. I uh, am not that familiar with their results. Okay. So um, for the person that asked that question, we'll be sure to get you that information after the session. Okay. Um, just a little bit, I know a little bit, just that uh, there's a state investigation into um, a rash of fetal anomalies in the Roaring Folk Valley area. Um, and so the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has been investigating um, what, they're, what they're seeing as higher than normal number of fetal problems um, that were reported in the state in March. Um, but we'll get, we'll get some additional information out to those folks for that. All right, so our next question uh, is... Were the wells near the mother's home active? Was wind direction considered and was gradient considered? Mother's home on the lower or higher ground? Uh, we did not have uh, data on those items and those, uh, those are things that we think need to be looked at in further studies. The next question here is, how did you determine the tertile breaks for well concentration and natural break? We did consider those. We we just uh, basically divided the um, exposed group into thirds. So where a third of the bursts were in the lowest tertile, a third of the bursts were in the middle tertile, and a third of the bursts were in the highest tertile. Mm 
our next question here is, did you run the analysis as continuous instead of category tertiles? We did run the, uh, the birth weight as continuous, and that's shown in the second graph on the birth weight slide. Uh, for the other outcomes, it was a dichotomous outcome, a yes or no. So we uh, could not run the um, outcome as a continuous. Um, was that the question? Or? Yes, I believe so. I think okay. that I think okay. that's it. Yes, great. Mm -hmm. um, so our next question is, can you go into more detail about the lack of information on uh, COGCC website? Uh, I'm not sure what this question is uh, getting at. Uh, lack of what type of information? Yeah, so um, that's a question from Michelle Hemingway. So Michelle, if you could just clarify, maybe we could try to address this later. Uh, thank you. Um, we will go on to the next question here, which is, mm -hmm. have you considered alternative weight, weighting methods for distance between mother's residence and wellhead locations? For example, using a weighting function that follows a dispersion pattern of key VOCs? Uh, we did not do that for this study as the, the study has not been done looking at the dispersion pattern of key VOCs off the well pads. So we don't yet have that information. Uh, that is also something that would be um, a valuable thing to do in a further study. We have another question here. It, would the compare group of non-exposed living at higher elevation have skewed the results for preterm births and low term births or low birth weight? Sorry, um, they def definitely did confound our results for low birth weight uh, when we looked at the unadjusted without adjusting for that. Um, so they were confounding our results, and we elevation was, and we did consider it in the analysis to remove the confounding. Next question here, did you study the presence of injection waste water wells in the 10 mile radius? We did not. Next question is, is it possible to include congenital abdominal wall defects in your analysis? Abdominal wall defects are often a sensitive indicator of environmental exposure. Uh, it, it would be, uh, possible to include those. I haven't looked into those, and I, I don't know what the prevalence of those are. As things, as the prevalence of these outcomes becomes gets rarer, uh, the the study and studying them becomes more challenging. Our next question here um, is not that air quality isn't complicated enough, but I wonder if you have given thought to the complicating factor of human exposure via water contamination and how that may interfere with or exasperate air exposure? Um, well, we haven't ruled out water exposure and we've, we've considered, um, we put air exposure out as a plausible explanation, but that does not mean that there, you know, you wouldn't consider water exposure too. Uh, the studies going forward should be looking at all the exposures around the home, um, air exposures and potentially water exposures. Uh, here in Colorado, uh, the water exposure may be important if, potentially important if someone's on well water and their well water was contaminated. Uh, there's quite a few people in Colorado that are, even in rural Colorado, that are municipal water supplies. So it's not as likely as it exposure route for them. Great. Now our next question is, can you suggest areas of focus for research? Um, if you were to make recommendations for people who are interested in doing research on the topic, uh, where should funding be directed right now to further understand these possible connections? Um, I believe uh, funding should, uh, one place funding can be directed is um, making this some of the links between first uh, measuring exposures and the health outcomes. Um, and some of the health outcomes are that should be focused on. Um, one of them is infants and, and children as a more sensitive population. 
um, health outcomes uh, such as asthma, uh, that, that's an air outcome. Um, some of the others like uh, cancer are, are more difficult in that the lag time between the exposure and the occurrence of the disease is longer, can be quite long in some cases. Um, the, as I had in the last slide, I think um, prospective studies where you're actually gathering some baseline information on populations and then following them for some specific outcomes or possibly uh, biomarkers of effect. So um, increases in uh, stress hormones, for example, um, that are some precursors to uh, negative health consequences also would be helpful. Great. Um, our next question is, have you considered doing a study on the relation between exposure to natural gas development and either autism or brain development in general? It would be an interesting study. I have not considered that <laughs> as a future study, though. And another question in here is, you commented on the limitations. Um, would you mind commenting a little bit on what you saw as being the greatest challenges uh, in the study? Uh, the challenges in the study? Uh, well, the, the challenges in the study right now are uh, just the lack of information that's readily available around um, natural gas development and, and the exposures. I think this is potentially um, with time improving, but at this point in time, we, we don't have, um, we don't know exactly what all the emissions are, exactly what is in the air, uh, how far some of these emissions can travel. We don't know what individuals are actually exposed to in their homes from these. We, we don't know what that um, potentially additive or synergistic effect might be between multiple exposures in air, water, and also some of the uh, psychosocial stresses around natural gas development as these uh, industrial processes are coming into communities and changing the um, fabric of the community. So those are some of the challenges in this. Great. Um, another question is, could you reanalyze your data for exposures down gradient, both downhill and downwind from well sites? Uh, we could go back into, in, in another study, we could go back into our cohort and um, do potentially what we would call a nested case control study where we would have a smaller set. We could go back in and look at uh, individual bursts and look more specifically what's going on. Uh, I'll remind you that we started it with 125,000 bursts. And so to go in and look at that for 125,000 individuals is not possible. We have to have a smaller set. Um, and Dr. McKenzie, we have, a, we have a person here thanking you for conducting and publishing this research and for presenting it in this format. Um, so we'll go ahead now and uh, wrap up. So thank you to everyone for your questions. Um, we plan on putting up sometime over the next week on the website some of the key questions along with answers that were asked um, throughout the series, so both today as well as in other sessions. Um, so we'll be notifying everyone when those are available. Um, so if folks have additional questions um, and if we didn't get a chance to get through your questions today, we will still do that. Um, please feel free to reach out to me at ellen at ceh.org and also to Dr. McKenzie um, or any of the other speakers in previous, uh, uh, in previous sessions that you um, have questions for. Um, so we hope that everyone benefited from the, the series that we have uh, presented today. And um, we will um, we hope that people feel that the information was useful in this session and other sessions. We will be administering a final survey to get feedback. Um, we thank those of you who have already provided us with a lot of information already that was very useful. Um, so we urge those who have not um, completed the survey um, to please go ahead and do that. We'll send out some, we'll, we'll go ahead and send that information out after this. Um, the recordings and slides for all the presentations are now up on the CEH website. Um, the one and the recording from today's session will be posted shortly as well. Um, so please keep your, your eyes open 
um, for that. I'll be sure to notify everyone. And also, just so you know, we will at CEH be having future webinar series that will be focusing on some different topics, but all will be relating to uh, maternal and community health. So we'll be sure to let everyone know when we have more information to share about those future sessions, as well as the speakers that will be participating. Um, those, uh, those webinar series will probably be likely taking place um, in the fall and winter of 2014 and 2015. So uh, again, thank you for those of you who joined us for the first time today, and thank you for those of you who have joined us for the last uh, six weeks. We really hope um, that you have learned a lot, and we look forward to having you all back for future educational webinar series. So thank you, everyone. Um, we'll be closing the session now. Take care.